this psalm, and we're going to look at verse 7 again. I'm going to preach a part two of the message I started last uh, Sunday. If you weren't able to see it or weren't able to be here, whatever, you might want to watch that and help you understand where we're at here. Uh, psalm 68 and verse 7, and about the middle of your Bible, look close to the middle of your Bible, page 533 in my Bible. Hey, Amen. Psalm 68 and uh, a psalm of David. And look at verse 7. He said, he says, O God, when thou went forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. And so I'm talking about the awful presence of God. This will be part two. God, help us, I pray, this morning as we minister the word of God. I pray for the anointing. I pray for the grace and the strength of the Lord God Almighty. Father, there's nothing I'd want to do without you. We want your glory. We want your presence, God. I want the, the dread of God to strengthen just touch our hearts again in the church today. I pray, Father, that you would come visit, bring revival, awaken and renewing of the Holy Ghost of God in our hearts. Touch every heart and soul and let our minds be stayed on you, Father. And I thank you, God. May we lift up the name of Jesus that you will touch and draw all men and women unto you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning as we talked about last week. What's missing in the church today, I believe, is the awareness of the awful presence of God. And through the years, the church is guilty of reducing God down to a human level. And I've heard people talk about God or refer to God as daddy or they refer to God as a good buddy or the man upstairs. And I'm grieved in my heart when I hear things like this. I've heard preaching that put him on a human level as if he's the same as you and me. And by doing this, we have lost the fear of God in the church. We've lost the reverence of God. We've lost the dread of God. And there's no longer a reverence in the church. I'm not saying that you don't fear God. I'm not saying that, that there, there aren't Christians that fear God. I know that there are, but I'm saying overall, I'm seeing a trend. I'm seeing a direction of the church today that we've lost the very reverence of God in the church. And I'll be honest with you, uh, I, some of us aren't going to like when I say this, but I, I believe that even the Catholic church seems to have more reverence for the holiness of God than Pentecostal churches of today. I'm not talking about just Protestant churches, but I'm talking even Pentecostal churches. And I say that something is wrong, that we have missed something uh, here. We've gotten off course somewhere and we need to pull it back. And that's what I'm trying to do uh, as I minister this word of God. We want to pull it back because we have to understand that God is holy holy and the presence of God the earth shook the Bible says at the presence of God the mountain shuddered at the presence of God the poured uh, uh, God earth poured out rain from heaven God poured out God touched God moved God God did this at the very presence of God Almighty and as I said last week you'll never worship a God that you can control you'll never worship a God that you can manipulate and if we put God on a human level and do not see him as Lord God Almighty then we'll never worship God correctly that's what's happening today we, we're worshiping but we're not worshiping God correctly. We're worshiping something. I can tell you that. Sometimes I won't get into all the things that we worship, but we worship things and we're not worshiping God correctly. We'll never reverence him as God. We'll never look to him as the all sufficient one. Now listen, understand God, he's not a golden calf. He's not some idol that's made up in the imagination of man's heart. He is the God of heaven. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. The Bible says that he is the spoken word that he is the word personified. The Bible says that he he is the great I am. He is the good shepherd. The Bible said he's the great shepherd and he's the great high priest and there's none like unto him and his arm is not too short that it cannot save. Who is this God and which I'm talking about? Well, I can tell you that he is magnificent. I know that he is glorious. I know that he's wonderful. He's our counselor and he's our prince of peace and he's come to redeem us from our sins and to give us everlasting life and his arm, like I said, is not too short to save. The Bible says it's in him was life and the life was the light of men hallelujah that's who God is and of course I can go more and tell you more adjectives and explain more definitions of who he is but for now I just want you to understand that he is he is Lord that he is God and the creator of the heavens and the earth now the word awful in the Hebrew means dreadful we talked about this last week it means uh, fearsome it means great it means awesome and I have to let me review a little thing a few things over here so that this message will make sense with you here today but in the Old Testament Jacob was we know touched by a holy dread of God. He was asleep and he had a vision of a ladder extended up into heaven.
heaven. And he saw angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. And he woke up and he said, surely the Lord's in this place. And I did not know it. And then Jacob was afraid. He said, how dreadful is this place? Or another translation would say, how awesome is this place? Daniel was another who was touched by the great dread of God's presence. God also said to all of Israel, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple and the light of God's glory. Isaiah saw his undoneness and when he saw God and his glory, he said, woe is me for I am undone from a man of unclean lips and dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. But when did that happen? Before or after he saw the glory of God? It was after he saw the glory of the Lord that he was shooken to the very core of his soul. John saw Jesus on the island of Patmos and he fell at his feet as a dead man. Listen, my beloved, if the church today be held but a fraction of God's holiness, but a fraction of God's dread, nobody would be able to stand in his very holy presence. We would be like the priests that fell prostrate when they dedicated Solomon's temple unto the Lord. Amen. We would acknowledge the holy presence of God and there'd be an honest or a reverence or a dread that would grip our very heart. I feel like today we feel uh, we have a casual worship and a casual dress and a casual God. And I know we, we say, come as you are. Well, that means come as salvation. You, you can't save yourself. You can't redeem yourself. You have to come as you are. People say, well, I want to clean my life up before I come to God. You can't clean your life up before you come to God. He's the only one that can cleanse you. So we take it out of context. But now that we know God, there ought to be an awful reverence of him and understand. And we need the dread of God to grip our hearts once again as to know who God is and reverence the Lord and have the fear of the Lord back in our hearts where the Bible says that's the beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is when there's a holy dread in your heart. The beginning of wisdom when the fear of the Lord has gripped your heart once again. Now the question is will we pay the price for such a manifestation of the glory of God? Will we put any effort into it? Will we separate ourselves under prayer because we say we want the glory of God but not many are willing to do what it takes to receive the glory of God. How many can say amen to that? They don't want to sacrifice. They don't want to put any time into it. Understand that God has as we talked about last week an appointed time for every movement, for every awakening. God has an appointed time for every restoration and every outpouring. And when that designated time comes, God awakens and stirs as if from our sleep. We need a stirring of God. We need to be wakened, awakened out of our sleep today spiritually. This stirring always occurs in man's darkest hours. If there's ever a time for the setting of God to awaken the church, I believe that we're living in it right now. America is in a crisis. Uh, people are in a crisis. Uh, humanity's in a crisis. Uh, the church church is even in a crisis and so we need the stirring of God to wake us up again when everything seems hopeless when everything seems lost at times when only a sovereign work of God can save the day that's where we are right now now understand where I'm at here no such event takes place without the full preparation of the Lord everything is in place when God speaks the word when God says that it's time and God always prepares vessels just prior to his outpouring he shuts men up in his presence and he places them in strategic places and we see the deliverance of Israel out of Pharaoh's grip of Egyptian bondage how, how God set up Moses and Aaron to prepare to deliver Israel out of bondage we see it when God was preparing Daniel and others after Israel 70 years of captivity into Babylon and God used Ezra the scribe to bring forth the holy word to the people to get them ready to go back to Jerusalem God used Nehemiah Haggai Zerubbabel for an appointed time to stir the hearts of the people for the work of God God used Esther for such a time as this to save her people. And once the Lord has decided he's going to move, how do we know when the set time for God's deliverance has come? Well, there are a few things that occur. Number one, we talked about last week. When God's set time comes or arrives, he builds a holy fire. How many know we need God to build a holy fire again? We need to see a, bu a bush that's blazing. Amen. We need to have an encounter with God. When it was time to deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage, God had to get the attention of those who were called to lead the people out of of darkness. God did this by building a fire. We know that Moses he saw a bush that burned but it wasn't depleted. In other words, God started a burning hallelujah. A burning in his bosom. A burning in his heart and I want God to burn once again in my heart. I many today would say I want God to burn in my heart. I want the blazing bush in my heart. I want God to move. I want God to awaken. I want God to stir my heart to where I'm not going through just dead religious routines. I'm just not going through some superficial ritual of a sacrifice, but I want the 
God of heaven to burn in my heart once again. I desire the stirring of God of the Holy Ghost in me. Hallelujah. Praise God. So God started a burning and Moses was alone on the mount of God and suddenly, and we see here in sovereignly, a fire was set before him. A flame was sent to arrest the man of God. It was a type of the Holy Ghost of the fire that never goes out. I'm going to tell you, the fire of God never goes out. It might go out in you and it happened to the five foolish virgins because at one time they had lamps. At one time they had oil. At one time they had the fire. At one time they were saved. At one time they knew God. They knew they were expecting return of the bridegroom. They were expecting in return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the delay, they ran out of oil and their lamps went out. What am I saying? They lost the Holy Ghost and they lost the fire. They lost God. They lost the power. How do I know? Because when it came time and when the bridegroom did come, we see that the five wise made it, but the five foolish could not come in because Jesus said, I'm sorry, but I don't know you. You workers of iniquity. I'm telling you, my beloved, at one time you had the fire. At one time you had the oil. But we've learned how to perform. We've learned how to be churchy. We've learned how to be religious. I don't want to be religious. I don't want to perform. I want the fire. I want the Holy Ghost. I want Pentecost. I want the Spirit of God to move upon the church, not just sword of life, but sweep the nations, almighty God. Come, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, come and let there be a burning bush in my heart to where I can feel God and know God and sense God. Hallelujah. All right, folks. Amen. We're just getting warmed up here today. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, I don't know. This might be a little bit different style of preaching than people are used to, but it's just the style that God gave me. All right. Understand here, I want the the fire of God. I want the fire of the Lord. The church needs uh, uh, to be baptized with a fresh fire. The fire that God started, a bush that burned, wasn't depleted. It was a fire that he put in Moses' heart. And from that point on in his heart would blaze with God's message. He was now captivated by God's holy presence. Think about this. He was in the presence of God. God spoke to them from out the midst of the bush. And he was now set apart to be a vessel of deliverance for his generation. The Bible said that Moses saw the fire and he turned aside. He could have walked on. He could have have gone, ignored it. He could have said, I have too many other things to do. I'm busy, but he didn't do that. He put aside all his own interests. He made time and room for God. Folks, you got to make time for God. If you want the fire of God, if you want the presence of God, you got to make room for God. We're not going to hear from God until we turn aside from our own way and give him our full attention. He waits until everything else is put aside. See, God loves you. God wants you. God wants your heart. He wants your all. Don't give him your sick and disease sacrifice that nobody else wants. Give him your first and your best. Give him your heart. Give him your life and your future and your plans. They say, That's what was happening when the Lord told Moses to take off your sandals for where you stand as holy ground. Moses, you give up your rights. You give up everything. You give up your will. You belong to me now. Bible says that we as the church, that we're not our own anymore, that we're bought at a price. And it was the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. You let God lead you. You let God guide you. You let God speak a word into your heart. Let God burn inside of you. You. Hallelujah. The church, the church lives by committees and it lives by organizations. It doesn't call on God. It doesn't believe God. It doesn't trust God. It doesn't, it doesn't ask God for direction. Man runs the church, the institution of the church. Listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. The church was never instituted by God to be run by man. You can look in Acts chapter 2 as to be emblazed and run by the power and the leadership of the Holy Ghost. You see the church in the New Testament and they had the fire. They had God. They had the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Paul wouldn't go anywhere unless the Spirit of God would lead him. He tried to go there and the Holy Ghost said Noah. He tried to go there and the Holy Ghost said Noah. He tried to go there and the Holy Ghost said said, Noah. But then he tried to go. He heard, he saw a vision of a man in Macedonia. And God was speaking to Paul, led by the Holy Ghost, and said, come on, Silas. We got work to do. Hallelujah. Mm, Somebody got to hear me. We, we, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we, want, we don't want to wait and tarry for it, but, oh, but we need God, and we want the fire. Amen. Now listen, so number one, he builds a holy fire. But number two, when this happens, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, the devil tries to put the fire out. That's what happens. God sends the fire, and immediately the devil tries to put the fire out. Moses came to the people with the heart blazing with the fire of God. And uh, you can see this in Exodus chapter 5 and so forth. And there was a great stirring among the people. Everyone was talking about the great new thing that 
God was going to do. God's going to do a new thing. And hope began to fill their broken hearts. And Moses came with a message. And he basically said, God's going to visit you, children. He's going to bring you out of your captivity. He's going to bring you out of your affliction. He's going to deliver you and your children and even your livestock. And the Bible said, not a hoof shall be left behind. And everyone and everything is coming out. And God's not going to leave anything behind. Listen up, church. This is how we ought to pray for our loved ones to be saved. The devil can't have them. Sin can't have them. The world can't have them. Darkness can't have them. Sin can't have them. They're coming out. You hear me? There's a word of faith. They're coming out. I want you to say it. They're coming out. They're coming out. How about Marion, Ohio? They're coming out. How about the nation of America? They're coming out. How about the nations of the world? They're coming out. Hallelujah. Amen. We're praying that their eyes will be opened and they'll come out of their bondage, come out of their captivity. We're praying for their souls. We're praying for their deliverance. Pharaoh can't have them. The devil can't have them. The world can't have them. They belong to God. Not a hoof shall be left behind. Somebody hear me. That's how we ought to pray. Listen to me. I don't want partial healing. I want all healing. I don't want partial salvation. I want all salvation. I don't want partial deliverance. I want all deliverance. Not a hoof shall be left behind. Some of you have settled for partial. You serve a partial God. The Bible, the God I read of the Bible, it's all or nothing. You show me where it isn't. It's all or nothing. Well, pastor, what about the man that was blind and, and, he, and Jesus prayed over him and, and he saw him in his trees? Huh? What about that? Yeah, that's a partial God. Let me tell you something. God wasn't finished yet. The reason Jesus did that was to help build the faith of the man that was blind. For the first time, he sees all of a sudden his faith is uh, strengthened and Jesus prayed again. See, and the man had the faith to believe God and he was completely healed. We don't serve a halfway house God. He, listen to me. He doesn't sort of deliver. He delivers. He doesn't sort of save. He saves. He doesn't sort of take you out of your captivity. He will bring you out of your bondage if you will believe, if you will trust, if you'll call on the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Man, he's got a mighty hand and a mighty arm. Church, I'm trying to help you today. You got to believe God. You need a healing. You got to believe God. You need a touch. You need to believe God. You need a bush that burns in your heart. You got to believe God, church. You got to believe him. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory. Now, with Moses, God backed up his message with signs and wonders, and he was anxious to let God's people know of the set time that had come. Now, God gave Moses three signs. Number one, remember this? Moses' rod turned into a serpent. Remember that? And then it back into a rod when he picked it up by its tail. And secondly, Moses' uh, hand became leprous uh, when he placed it in his bosom. Remember that? Took it out as leprous. Then he put it back in, removed it again, and it was healed. God was revealing his power, and God was strengthening the faith of Moses. Thirdly, water from the river when poured out of the cup became blood. Remember that. So let's look at the picture here. Moses and Aaron are on fire. God's beginning to reveal himself. His word of deliverance has come. It's been 430 years. That's a long time to be in bondage. And a body of believers has been awakened and God is visiting with his people. But in the midst of the promise, God issues a strong warning. Exodus 3 and 19. God said, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even even by a mighty hand. Why couldn't God just say the word? You know that God could just say the word, wipe out all the Egyptians, wipe out Pharaoh, and deliver his people, but God could have done that. God could have made it easy on them, and God could make it easy on you, but he won't. Because he cares about your character. He cares about your faith. You see, faith moves mountains. If we had the faith of a size of a grain of a mustard seed, mountains would be cast into the sea. So God cares about your faith and Israel's faith. And God wanted Moses and all the people of deliverance, uh, uh, that uh, people that uh, of deliverance, he wanted them uh, coming to him and trusting him by faith. God will bring them out. All that he promised will happen. But the devil was furious. Amen. You're in for a fight, church. It won't be easy because Satan will do all that he can to try to stop the work. 
work of God in you and your life and your family and your home and your church and your ministry. It's a fight. It's going to be war. Amen. It's a war in the heavenlies and it's going to be harder and harder. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 tells you that. That we fight not with flesh and blood, principalities and powers and, 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 and heavenly places. We know that. That's the spiritual battle there. The devil's going to do all that he can to try to resist you. Pharaoh who was the king of Egypt represents Satan who is the king of the abyss and the god of this world. The Bible says this about the devil. He's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. And I don't know about you, but it seems he's working overtime right now. Satan is working in the hearts of the rebellious people towards God right now. Rebellion towards God. Even think about today, the month of June now. They call it Pride Month. Yeah, this is Pride Month. They're proud of their homosexuality. They're proud of their abomination to God. They're proud of their perversion. They're proud of their sin. And uh, we ought to pray for them and we ought to reach out to them. I, I realize this and show that hating, you can't hate people into heaven. We don't like it. Uh, uh, we're living in a time where America is becoming Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the time even uh, Jesus warned us uh, as the days of Noah were, well, so will the coming of the Son of Man and be. Well, there was wickedness in Noah's day. He was a preacher of righteousness, but nobody would listen to Noah and people don't want to listen to us today. But that doesn't stop us from living righteously. That doesn't stop us from proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, listen to me. I love you, but if God doesn't agree with your sin, I cannot agree with your sin. I love you. I care about you. But if God won't accept it into heaven, I cannot accept it into heaven. Listen to me, my beloved. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't want to hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but God's word is God's word, and you're not going to change it and quit trying to misinterpret it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, and our nation's a mess and we're going the wrong direction. We know that America's turned away from God. Blessed is the nation whose Lord is God. Well, we're in, in America, America no longer has turned toward God and they, they, they've left God years ago and we're going the wrong direction and I've never seen or heard so much filth and garbage and debased thinking as we've seen today at our present time. We're calling right, wrong, and wrong, right? I mean, we're in this time when, you, when they say that a man can become pregnant. This is just, this talk, they say, let's follow the science. Okay, let's follow the science. All right, men, go ahead. It's the, it's the, it's the most reprobate uh, thinking that you have today, and they're teaching our children. And you've got people that are standing up, and governors and representatives that are passing laws and say, you'll not, touch sex, you'll not teach sexuality to children ages up to the fourth grade or third grade, whatever it might be. Not even, that's young, even the third grade, uh, even after. But let me tell you something. The, the, the devil is mad. Pharaoh is angry. The Satan is on fire. He's angry. He's mad. He's coming against righteousness and everything that's of God. Even look at the rainbow that we have that God told us in Genesis is a promise that he'll never flood the earth again. Again. And now they've taken that which is God, twisted it, and now used that, and they say that's now gay pride. And you see, Satan takes everything of God that is pure, that is holy, that is righteous, and twists it and uses it for his kingdom and not for the kingdom of God. But we know what that rainbow represents. It represents the promise of the Lord our God. Yes, my beloved, our nation is in trouble. God, have mercy and help us and pray for the lost and pray for the nation. Pray for your lost loved ones. But listen, don't think for a moment that the devil played dead when God's people are being stirred and the message of God's visitation of his people is being preached. Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go. But Pharaoh answered, who is the Lord that I should obey the voice to let Israel go? And Pharaoh said that he didn't know the Lord nor would he let Israel go. Have there ever been times when you rebuked the devil but he didn't buke? Have there been times like that when you're in the battle? Amen. When warfare was going and taking place, maybe there have been times when the devil was roughing you up. He was fighting you hard. Oppression and darkness over your mind and you did your best to cast him out but he just kept fighting I know what that's like I've been there many times in my own life sometimes it's hard to pray and sometimes it's hard to worship it's hard to read the Bible it feels like a heavy weight upon you. Darkness overshadowing your mind. You can't think right. Maybe the devil's fighting you hard. He's fighting your family. And God's called you to pray and to travail over your lost loved ones. But do you think for a moment that Satan will let them go without a fight? Come on, church. we got to snap out of this uh, uh, and understand what's going on. Pharaoh didn't let go easily. He fought. He resisted the word of God. He resisted the man of God, Moses. He resisted everything that was of God. In fact, the Bible tells us that things got harder for Israel instead of easier. Things got worse, not better. 
later. Pharaoh considered himself to be God, and as far as he's concerned, he's the only God can allow Israel to go. And if he says no, then the answer is no. I don't care who stands before me, whether it be Moses or anybody else. That's the way Pharaoh thought. Pharaoh made the work harder. He doubled their workload. Not only that, but they, but they had to now make bricks without straw. My point is this. You have someone who has determined to get closer to God. You have someone who has just been delivered from alcohol or drugs. You have someone that is a great victory in their life or, or a great move of God in their heart. They've made a decision that Jesus will be first in their lives and they're going to serve God with everything they have. Suddenly the enemy comes in with full force to pull you back into bondage. He wants to keep you into slavery, into sin. He wants to keep you from consecrating your life to the Lord. He wants to drag you back into the captivity of sin. And Pharaoh says, I won't let you go because you belong to me. Now, this is what you're dealing with today. This is what's going on with your family and your children and your grandchildren. Now, when Moses, Moses told Pharaoh to let God's people go, Satan was enraged by God's visitation. See, a devil got mad that God showed up. And the outbreak of vengeance that followed came straight from hell itself. Israel's leaders were beaten. Their workload was doubled. And now they had to make brick without straw. And Pharaoh said, let more work be laid on them. In other words, lay a heavier burden on the church. Lay a heavier burden on the saints of God. You want to pray more? Okay, devil says, I'll show you. I'll attack you more. Oh, you want to, you want to be more faithful? Okay, that's okay. I'm going to throw everything there is in front of you to cause you to stumble. I'm going to do everything I can. I, this is war. You see, God, you, you think you're going to serve God? No, I'm going to try to stop you. You don't belong to God. You're coming back to me. Oh, no, no, no. I know, I know. So he lays a heavier burden on them. If they want to serve their God, if they want to go worship their God, then make it harder on them. The Israelite leaders met Moses and Aaron as they came out of Pharaoh's palace, and they complained to them. And they said, let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Now, they were basically saying this. Moses all the praying on God's mountain, all your talk about a great visitation from God, all your preaching about restoration and healing and deliverance, it's getting us nowhere. In fact, Moses, it's making things worse. My life is not better, it's worse. It's stirring things up too much. We can't take any more of this fury from the enemy. We see no sign of God at work. We are rejected and we're still not delivered. The scripture says, but they did not heed Moses because the anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Now, even after this, Moses lost heart, and Moses became discouraged. Now, now I would too. How many here would not be discouraged? Because, I mean, you're thinking, man, wait a minute. Now, God, you called me. I saw a bush that burned. It wasn't depleted. That fire is now in me. I saw the miracle of, of my rod being turned into a serpent, back into a rod. My hand was leprous, and, you, and then you healed it. I've seen the power of God. God, you sent me. I didn't make this up. Did I make this up? Did I really see a bush burn? Was this really the Lord? Was this me? Was I, what was this? And so you start doubting what God spoke to you. You start doubting the miracle that was in your life. You start doubting what God did you. And the devil says, no, that wasn't God. That was just your imagination. Oh, you just wanted to see God, or you just wanted to hear from God, or that was just your subconscious. My friend, no, that wasn't subconscious. Listen to me. I know the devil's done that to me. Maybe the devil's done that to you. But I always go back to the time when Jesus saved my soul. And when he saved me, that wasn't made up in my heart. That wasn't made up in my mind. When he saved me, he saved me. When he delivered me, he delivered me. And, and let me tell you, I was a changed person by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I was transformed by the power of the blood. Sometimes you might question, am I saved? Go back to when God saved you. Yes, you're saved. Oh, do you love the Lord? Yes, you love God. Maybe you don't love him like you need to love him, but yes, you love God. And if you don't love him like you think you ought to be loving him, ask God to put a new renewed love in your heart for him. Amen. Praise God. After this, Moses lost heart. Now Moses said, Lord, he's praying to God. Why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you've sent me? Why am I even here? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. I mean, uh, oh, I can just hear the church today. I'm not going to that church. I'm not listening to that pastor. Every time I, every time I go to that church, I get attacked by the devil. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yep, that's right. Perhaps Moses forgot that God warned him that this would happen. God said to Pharaoh that uh, God said that Pharaoh would let him go. See, the devil is going to fight hard, and this will also happen within the church and the saints of God. Listen, we have been warned too. It's for First Peter five and eight says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour." And from the time of Pentecost to this very day, every outpouring of the Holy Ghost 
Ghost has brought forth the wrath of Satan, church. Amen. After the outpouring of the Spirit in the upper room, multitudes were saved. Over 3,000 were saved. The Lord came down and shook everything in sight. The poor heard the gospel preached. The lame were healed. Signs and wonders and miracles abounded as people's lives were being changed and transformed by the power of the gospel of Christ. The gospel works. Jesus is alive. The blood is sufficient. Hallelujah. But it didn't take long before the devil got stirred up. Then the priests and the Sadducees and the scribes were grieved that the people were being taught about Jesus. And so they laid hands on Peter and John and they put them in prison. Remember that? Until the next day. And they said, now listen here. We don't want you preaching in the name of Jesus. We don't want you talking about Jesus. We don't want you telling anybody about this Jesus now. He died on the, he died on the cross. Okay, he's dead now. We don't want you talking about this. But Peter saw the resurrected Lord. See, he had an encounter with the bush that burned that wasn't depleted. You understand what I'm talking about? He had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he said... Uh, 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 to obey God rather than men. Hallelujah. Praise God. All through the New Testament, the moment God moved, the devil reacted. And if Satan isn't reacting against you, maybe it's because you haven't threatened his kingdom. I'm telling you, and I'll tell you now, the devil doesn't like this church being here. He doesn't like us preaching the gospel of Christ. And he sure doesn't like us reaching children and making an impact in their lives. It's war, church. It's going to be a fight. Pharaoh does and give up easy. The devil's going to fight. He's going to make war with the saints. See, he thinks that he has this area secured. <laughs> Woo, something going on there. <laughs> the devil thinks he has this area secured. They're here. You see, he, he thinks, but there's light in this darkness, and the light is Jesus Christ. And his children go forth in the power of the Holy Ghost, proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. You see, God will test us before he moves ahead. And we tend to pray through to get relief from the burden, and then we sit back and then we wait. But satanic harassment is a sign that we're touching God. If the devil's fighting you, it's because you're touching heaven. If the devil's fighting you, it's because you're doing something in the heavenlies. Your prayers are effective. Something's happening. You're shaking in the spiritual realm. There's, there's something taking place. Amen. Are you enduring hardship? Pray on. Is the answer beginning to unfold? Pray more. Is the rain beginning to fall? Pray harder. Don't stop touching heaven. Bombard heaven with your praying. Can we have a praying church that a bombard heaven? Bombard heaven with your praying. When God called Moses to the mount, he swept him up into a cloud of glory and for six days the Lord said nothing. Moses is in the presence and glory of God and yet God said nothing. At that time he was shut up with God in the fire of his holiness where God was preparing for him for a great word to give him. And then in Exodus 24 and 16 and on the seventh day God broke the silence. On the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now are you willing to wait on the mount and the glory? I ask this because most of the time we just want a quick blessing from God with no sweat, no tears, no agony, no waiting on God. We demand from God with no tearing, no agony of prayer, no seeking his face. We have this microwave mentality. Pop it in, get it out in 10 seconds or 30 seconds. No, there's a waiting, there's a tearing, there's an agony, there's pouring your heart out to God. Listen, if God speaks once again to this generation, if his glory comes again, it'll be to those who are willing to shut themselves up with God. It'll be with those. It'll be with those who are shut up with God until the fire of his awful presence burns out all the self and all the flesh and all the sin. And we can have no cloud of his presence, no desperate hunger to go to him until he speaks. The Bible said in John 6 and 44, no one come, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so I know this, when God begins to burn a fire in you, I know the devil tries to put the fire out. But number three, this is a short point here today. Number three, when God's presence comes, you desire more of him. What happens when the glory of a presence of God manifests itself? Those who have repented and those of righteous heart hearts fall before him and they worship God. They purge themselves and they cry out to God to cleanse them like Isaiah when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Oh God, he saw and he said, woe is me. God purged his sin. God cleansed him as the seraphim took the live coal from the altar and touched his lips. Once they experience his glory, they want more. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Do I have a witness today? They go from glory to glory. Paul said, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by 
by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. We see in the Bible these words that are written. And the Lord said to Moses, come up unto the Lord. Come up unto the Lord. Come up unto the Lord. Moses got one revelation of God's glory after another until finally his face was aglow with the Lord's glory. Israel could not stand even look upon him. He put a veil over his face. I don't think Moses should have put a veil over his face, my friend. That's my own opinion, church. When the glory of God hits you, don't be ashamed. When your countenance changes by the glory of God, don't be ashamed. Let the world see that there's something different about you. God is real, and God is trying to manifest himself to a lost world through the vessels of the righteous of his own people that are saved by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we, we hear Moses pleading with God in Exodus 33 and 18. Please show me your glory. And God will have a people. Listen to me. He will have a people in these last days who will give him no rest until he again reveals his awful glory. I tell you that. They may not be many, but God always has a remnant. And in these last days, when there's so much evil, look at it, church. You can't ignore it. You can't deny it. There's evil beyond evil like we've ever seen before in our life. We're discussing and talking about things that we've never had in our imaginations 20 or 30 years ago about gender changes and multiple genders and all this kind of thing. That's demented thinking. That's reprobate thinking. That's the devil's world that's influencing all the people that don't know the Lord. There's only two genders. God made them male and female. That's the word of God. But people are trying to play God. They want to change and they want to take uh, uh, these pills that, that uh, change their hormones and try to change a man to a woman and a woman into a man and all this kind of thing. And they're telling children that they're going to have to uh, be able to decide at a young age, at five or six or seven years old, that they can change their gender if they want to. Uh, oh no, listen to me. They're not old enough to be drafted. They're not old enough to make a decision on other things. Uh, Oh, but they're going to make them, allow them to make a decision. Listen, no, 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 no. Parents, it's time to rise up and fight the devil and say, Pharaoh, you'll not have my family. Pharaoh, you'll not have my wife. You'll not have my husband. And Pharaoh, you will not have my children. My children that are made in the image of God. My children belong to the Lord. Hallelujah. You'll not have them. God made them in his image. And God knows exactly what he's doing. The devil is trying to twist everything that God has made. And you have demented people that are thinking this way that it's okay. It's not okay. Oh, glory to God. You've never thought better than a person that's saved and knows that book right there. Amen. Mm. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You're, you're going to say that, that a child at the age of five or six can change their gender and you've got doctors and you've got hospitals and institutions at, that allow this? Are you, listen, church, you understand where we're at? I'm trying to tell you, Pharaoh is fighting hard. It's war. It's war. It's war. Lord God, have mercy. Please wake up. Please, the church, arise and understand what's happening today. Oh, Lord God, help us. God, help us. Now, Moses see the glory of God. He wanted to see, and God is a remnant, but in these last days, there's evil, there's darkness, there's wickedness, there's perversion, there's reprobate minds and thinking, and God will have a people that will serve him even in the midst of all that. He will have a people that will cry out to him desiring to see his glory, and God will have a remnant church, and God will have a remnant people that will hunger after truth, that will hunger after righteousness, and they'll fear and they'll reverence God. A holy dread will grip their hearts once again, and they will experience revelation after racial revelation of the God of heaven according to the Bible, the word of God, and the world, and all its shine will fade compared to the love that you'll have for the Lord. Hallelujah. You won't want the things of the world, but you'll just want God. You'll want his glory. I want his presence. I want his word. I want his truth. And at one point we see Moses. Now listen, I got I to. All right. We're, we're going to start bringing this aircraft down now. <laughs> we're about 55,000 feet. We're going to bring her on down about 28, okay? Okay. I want to show you something that's going to blow you to pieces. Are you ready to be blown to pieces? <laughs> All right. Now listen. This is crazy. At one point we see Moses. We see Aaron. We see 
Nadab and Abihu. And you know later Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire unto the Lord. And they were stricken dead by the fire. Judgment of God came upon them. It's crazy. And, uh, but we see Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, along with the 70 elders, going up to the mount to the presence of God. And the Bible says this. Look at Exodus 24 and 10. Look at this. And, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. I think sapphire is blue. It's, it's incredible. Now, they saw this. It, it's not a dream. They saw this with their very own eyes. And it was like the very heaven, heavens in its clarity. It's like they saw the smoke of God. They saw the glory of God. And they saw sapphire. As, it's beautiful. They, they saw the fire and the, the presence of Almighty God. The Bible says that the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire. They experienced this. They saw this. They saw God aid in His presence and visibly beheld His awesome holiness and glory. And yet, get this, get this. And just 40 days later, they backslid completely. 40 days. 40 days. How is that possible? I don't know. How can that be? How is it possible to see the glory of God and to see the heaven, the sapphire like heavens, and to see the smoke and the presence of God that shook the, that quaked the mountain, that shook the mountain, that ate in his very presence, and then in 40 days they backslide? How, how can that be? I'll tell you how that can be. Listen, my beloved, if there's anything in our hearts or if, if we are not completely surrendered and rid of all sin, we can backslide in a matter of weeks. Listen, if you're holding on to something else, if you're not completely surrendering, I have talked to people that I have loved and I have nurtured and I have taught and ministered the gospel of Christ and I'll say, I love you, but you're holding back. There's something in you that's holding back and they won't confess it. They will not tell me, uh, but there's something in there. There's something, you're just, you're, there's something of the world. There's something that Pharaoh is offering you and you're looking at that. You see God, you see the smoke, you see the glory, you see the fire of God, you see the sapphire you have this incredible encounter with God but yet there's something in your heart that looks at once or is holding on to something of Pharaoh Amen. you might say well pastor I'm not like that that never happened to me listen but this tendency is in all of us we have the propensity. Now listen, these were the same children of God who an answered together and said that they would do everything the Lord said. They would obey his word, but now they've gone their own way. I've known people that have experienced the touch of God. They had encounters with his glory. I tell you the truth, but instead of embracing God, they embraced the idols of this world and they left God. They left his anointing. They left his glory. But folks, there's nothing of this world that compares to the glory of God. I know Satan tries to simulate and imitate it. He tries to entice and fool people. But it's going to take a people that will completely empty themselves out to God and embrace him with all of their heart. That's, that's what's needed today. That's what it's going to take. Listen, you can't, please don't, don't, don't fall asleep on me, okay? Just, just hear me out. This is what God's looking for. I know, you say, well, that's kind of radical, I've never heard preaching like that. That's okay. That's okay. We serve a radical Jesus, a radical God, and a radical Bible. And I, I just pray that what God's looking for, that that'll be you. I hope that you are the ones, uh, one of those who want to see his glory. I pray that God's holy dread will once again grip our hearts, myself included with you. The church will be filled with the awesome awareness of his holiness. They'll, re, they'll, they'll reverence God once again. Once again, they reverence God. And they will see him as God and, and the Lord of glory. They'll fear the Lord once again. And they'll pray that God will come once again into their hearts. And they'll see him for who he is. I, I pray for that. I, I, I don't, today God gives us glimpses. He gives us touches. He, he begins to move, begins to pour out. Heaven begins to open up just a little bit. And we begin to praise him. And we can feel and sense the very presence of God. And we get a little touch of heaven. But then we're satisfied with that. And we back off. God says there's more. There's more. And, and God, I believe, listen, I, I think this is, I'm closing now. Abby, if you come, that helps me to close, okay? It, let me just say this. <laughs> let me say this, that, that it, listen, if, the, if the, we're getting to the place now where, where the world out there doesn't even respect the church. And we, we had a crazy thing, the cable that holds the gate on the back, the gate together holds it up or it gives it strength. They stole it. They stole the cable. Probably a $5 part, $10 part. But they stole it. And I'm just saying, is it getting that bad that they're going to steal a cable? I mean, 
It used to be, and it is, if it's not bolted down or chained up or locked down, they're going to steal it or whatever. Yes, I realize that. But now, the, really? <laughs> there was a time when people that weren't even saved would reverence the church. They would leave the church alone. They might rob and steal from other things, but they'd leave the church alone. But, but I'm saying this. It's because the church has lost its glory. What, what do you mean, Pastor? I don't understand what you're saying. If we become like the world... If we become just like them, act like them, talk like them, dress like them, if we, if we are just like the world and we have the spirit of the world in the church, then there's nothing different about us. And they don't reverence even the church anymore. They don't even respect the church anymore. I believe that we got to show the world something more than just words. Something more. I think something of heaven needs to come. The glory of God. The, the Lord. We need him to, to put a burning bush in our heart again. We need to show God. We need to show the world that God is not dead. He's a living, powerful, almighty, all-sufficient God. And God is holy. We need the awesome dread of the Lord to come back. The awesome presence of the Lord back in our hearts, back in the church, back in the pulpit. Holiness. What's wrong with holiness? I'm so tired of people saying it's legalism. It's not legalism. It's not bondage. I've come not just to go to church today. I've come to meet the Lord of glory, the King of glory. I've come to meet Jesus. I've come to meet him. There, there was a time in the, in the 40s and 50s when the Pentecostal church was so on fire, when the Pentecostal church had the burning bush in its midst, when the Pentecostal church was so radical for the Lord Jesus Christ, people were being healed, people being delivered, people being saved, people being baptized in the Holy Ghost, lives radically changed, that the world was scared of them. And I know stories of a little girl that was walking down the street and her mama told her, when you come across to close to that Pentecostal church, you run as fast as you can on the other side, and you walk on the other side of the street until you get past that Pentecostal church. Those people are crazy. Those people are weird. That's right. The Bible said we're aliens. We ought to be weird. The world doesn't understand us because the world doesn't understand God. And I know the world won't love us because the world doesn't love Jesus. I understand that. But folks, I don't know which it is. I don't know if you love the world more or you love Jesus more. And I think Jesus is wondering the same thing. No, I want the glory and the presence and the fullness of God. I want something in my heart that burns in me that says, I want Jesus. I want the burning bush. I want the fire. I want Pentecost. Would you stand to your feet, please? Hallelujah. Glory. Glory, just worship. Glory, just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Do it in us, Lord God. Do it in us, Lord God, I pray. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to ask you here today, is there a burning fire in your heart for God right now? Is there a burning desire in your heart for God? Hallelujah. Is there? Amen. Hallelujah. Just raise your hand. Say, yes, Pastor. If there isn't, ask God to put it in there. Put it in there, Lord God. Let me ask you this. Is there a yearning in your heart to experience His glory? Would you ask God to stir your heart? Would you just ask the Lord, I need it. I want God to put a yearning in my heart for His glory. I want it. Is there anything that we are holding on to? that's keeping us from total surrender. Are you holding on to Pharaoh? Are you holding on to something that he's offering you? He's lying to you. The devil's lying to you. And if you are holding on to that and haven't completely surrendered to God, you are in danger of backsliding within 40 days. I tell you that. It can happen. Backsliding always begins in the heart. Hallelujah. Are you one of those who are saying to God, like Moses, show me your glory? Are you one of those? Show me your glory. I just want to call the church to come up front here. Let's pray together. I just want to call you on up here. And let's pray together. Come on. Believe God together. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In my 
my heart, God. I want to see your glory. Just come on. Come on, let's worship the Lord together. Don't, don't be afraid. That's okay. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Just come to the Lord. We're coming by faith. Step of faith here today. And I, I pray in our hearts right now. We'd say, God, God, I, I want you, Lord Jesus, to put a holy reverence in my heart. I want the holy fear of God back in my heart. I want to see you for who you are. I, I want the holiness of God. I want to see the Lord. I need a vision of the Lord, a revelation of the Lord. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm asking right now, God, I, I don't want to play religion. I don't just want to go to church out of duty or out of routine. But I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a fight, church. You got to remember this. It's a fight for your healing. It's a fight. You have to understand. It's a fight for salvation, for your loved ones. It's a fight for the backslider. It's a fight. It's war. Pharaoh's fighting. He won't let him go easily. But listen to me. We will hold on to God. We will cling to God. We will cling to Jesus. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I know the devil fights. I know he knows his time is limited. We've got to fight. We've got to pray. We've got to believe. We've got to worship. If there's ever a time, I pray that God would come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come in this church. Come in your people, God. Hallelujah. Just begin to pray right now. I want to ask you to pray. God, show me your glory. Show me your glory, Lord God. Show me your glory, God. Show me. Show me your glory. Show me your glory, God. Just begin to cry out to the Lord. Begin to cry out to the Lord. Show me, God. Amen. Come out of your comfort zone. Come out of your comfort zone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. I worship. Oh, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, you are here working in this, in this place. place. Hallelujah. I worship Lord, hallelujah. I Glory. Put your all, give your all to God. You I hold nothing back. I hold nothing back. Hallelujah. Jesus. 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 That is who you Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. And the Bakia Papa 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 Pasha Catabaco, La Papa 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 Pasha Catabaco, La Papa 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 Hallelujah, my Lord, how did it get to the book? 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 In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I want your glory, I want your touch, I want your glory. In the name of the Lord, 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 in Hallelujah. 
I, I'm, I'm in 100%. How about you? I, 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 not holding on to something of the world, but I, I give my all to God. And I want to see his glory. I want to experience his glory, his awful presence. And I pray that the holy dread of God would grip the church. And when the holy dread of God grips the church, we'll begin to worship him. And we'll begin to worship him in spirit of truth. We'll worship him according to his will. It'll be by the spirit of God. It will not be by the flesh. God will begin to reveal things to you of himself according to his word. He'll open up heaven. You'll encounter God. There'll, there'll be a fire blazing in your heart. Something of God. It'll be miracle, miraculous. It'll be of heaven. It's of the spirit of the Lord. God will show himself to you. God will reveal himself to you. And you're going to take that out to a lost, dying world. And they're going to see something in you that's different than just a churchgoer. You've met Jesus. They see the glory of God upon your countenance. As the Spirit of God blazes from your heart, they'll see something of the Lord, something of God. They'll begin to ask questions. You'll begin to, they'll open their hearts. You'll begin to share with them about your faith. Understand that Jesus is not dead. He's not a dead religion. He's a life changer. He's a life changer. God, God is saving. God is delivering. God is working. But God wants to draw us closer and to bring us into the inner courts. Would you come into the inner courts by faith? I want you to trust him. I want you to trust him right now. God, I give it all to you. I give it all to you. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray with you, church. I want you to believe the Lord. I want you to believe God here today. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray over you. And I want you to believe God with me. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, as we come to you today in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for your power and your grace and your glory. Father, your word does not lie. You've shown us here where Moses experienced the fire of God and the glory of the Lord. We see where Israel was delivered by the hand of God and the power of God. Father, we're here today, and we're saying that we're open vessels unto God. We're broken before you. Father, we have a people here that have a heart for you. They desire God. They want the fire of God. They want the bush that burns in their heart. They want to experience and encounter the Lord. And I believe, God, that you're going to reveal and show them your glory, and you're going to use them. And, they, they, God, these will be the remnant people, the remnant church, a, a people that reverence you, a people that have an honest for the Lord, a people that have the fear of the Lord. They have wisdom in their hearts. God, they don't want to just be religious. They don't want to just go through the routine of church, but they want to encounter the Lord. God, you have a remnant people. We may be few over the entirety of the world, but we have a remnant people that are intercede, that'll pray, that have a heart for God, that, that feel the heart, that senses the heart of God and the burden of the Lord. We are living in a world of darkness, a world of sin, a world of reprobate thinking, but God, you have a people that are your own. You have a people that know you. You have the people of righteousness. You have a people that have a heart to to live and to walk in the purity of the Lord. Father God, I pray that you'd wash us, cleanse us of all sin. I pray right now, God, and I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus for the touch of God upon every woman and every man, every child. I pray in the name of the Lord, the hand of God, the touch of God right now to minister to their hearts. Touch them, Lord, with your anointing. Touch them, Lord God. Something's gonna be different. God, we've relinquished everything to you. God, oh God, we're not holding on to anything of this world. Nothing that Pharaoh offers. But God, we pray in the name of Jesus. God, God, my Lord. God, my Lord, show us your glory. Show us your glory. Show us your glory, God. Show us your glory, Father. God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Now, now church, we, we I'm... I'm given up all the world and given up everything of this life everything of the world everything of Egypt everything of Pharaoh and I'm, I'm holding on to God I'm clinging to God I'm embracing God I, I, I don't want to be a mediocre Christian but I, I listen and you don't want to be that because it's, it's a boring life it's a boring prayer life it's a boring walk if you're just mediocre but I'm telling you, you can pass through the natural into the supernatural by faith. And you can see the mountain full of fire and smoke. And you can see, you can see the, the floor, if you will, as sapphire. You can see heaven. I believe that. That God will show you as Paul, whether he was caught up in God, 
caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body, out of the body, he did not know. But he had his, these incredible encounters. That's the New Testament after the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's after Pentecost. Paul had revelations of God. God can reveal himself to you. God will show himself. So let's not settle for less. Let's settle for more. I'm striving. I, I'm striving now. Jesus said to strive to enter by the straight gate, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. You've got to press in. Church, let word of life press in. Life comes to all of us, I understand. Discouragements and setbacks, I get it. But continue to press in and continue to fight. Fight the good fight of faith. You, I... I I don't know how to, I don't want to, listen, some of you have given up. You're good people. You love God. You come to church. Okay, what's wonderful. But you've given up. I don't want you to give up. God doesn't want you to give up. Hallelujah. Every time we have service, I want you to come and ask God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In the middle of worship, I want you to pray for God to pour His glory out on you. I want you, I want you to pray that God would open up the heavens for you. Now, there are going to be people that either want God or they don't want Him. You can't force Him. You can't make Him. You can't, you can't condemn Him in. You can't hate Him in. You just, that's just the way it is. They walked away from Jesus. They'll walk away from the truth. They'll walk away from God today. But there are, a remnant, there is a people that do really have a heart for the Lord. And I hope that's you. I hope that's you. I hope and pray that that is you. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. That's it. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. But pull it down to strongholds. Cast down every imagination, every thought. victorious to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come back tonight, 630 if you can. If you can, we'd love to have you. But I want you just to shake some hands and hug some necks this morning and say, God bless you. God love you. God bless you. God love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank God for his glory. I thank God for his glory. I thank God. Thanks for joining us if you are with us here or live on Facebook. God bless you. God bless you, church. We love you. God bless every one of you. The Lord bless you. Keep you. May his face shine upon you. Hallelujah. May God give you his peace and his presence. Glory to the Lord.